like you're on. Okay. All right. She said we're ready to go. So uh, we will let us um, first let me welcome you all. It's good to see you here. And I hope you enjoyed this chapter. This is one of my new favorites. Oh my goodness. And there's so much richness here. So we're going to take our time and we're going to plan to get through the first 17 verses. Now we'll encourage you, make sure that you do have questions for 16, because next time we'll try to finish chapter 15 and then go on and start in chapter 16. So you should already have those questions and you can be working on those. Oh, you don't? Oh, look at Kim. She's so on top of it. Well, then you can get your questions for chapter 16 today and start working on those. Um, I have more stuff than I can ever cover, but I just was, I was just so enthralled with this chapter. I hope you were too. I think it's one of the most important chapters in John. Uh, John chapter three might be the most important for how to get into the family of God. Remember we talked about in John's gospel, he is sharing, how do you get into the family? And uh, in the epistles to John, first, second, and third John, he's writing, same author is writing, how do you have fellowship once you're in the family? Well, how to conduct yourself once you're in the family. So for a non-believer, John chapter three might be the most important because it so clearly says that the only way to, G to God is through Jesus, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that's how you get into the family. But once you're in the family, I think chapter 15 is probably the most important. And so we're gonna make sure today that we understand it so that we can do it. Um, and um, I think it's kind of the forgotten sermon. How many of you were familiar with chapter 15 and you, you'd heard, you know, that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and have heard abiding in Christ? How many have heard that? We've all heard it. But as I studied it, I thought I know very few that are doing it. And I would ask you, you don't have to raise your hand. Do you think you know how to abide in Christ and that you are doing it? Because I will tell you, remember we talked about the great commission in Matthew 28, that before Jesus, right before he was resurrected, he gave what's called the great commission to the disciples and said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then here's the part we leave out and teaching them what? whatsoever I have commanded. And I think I asked you last time, I, I remember the shock to my system when I went, commanded, what did Jesus command? You know, I knew the 10 commandments, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, teach them whatsoever I have commanded. And remember in our chapter last week in 14, when Jesus is telling them, I'm going back to the father, but you don't have to worry because I'm still going to be present with you. And how is he going to be present with us? Through the Holy Spirit. But how do we know? How do we experience his presence in us? He tells you. And, and remember uh, which one of the disciples, Thomas, said, how will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, the Father will love you, I will love you, and we will manifest ourselves to you. That's talking about an experiential experience of the presence of God. And what is it connected to? How do you have to experience it? Obedi obedience to his commands. We don't even know what his commands are. So no wonder we're not experiencing him. So we're going to really get into this and we may step on my toes and your toes, uh, but I want to make sure because J the book of James is so clear. It's not the person that knows the word of God that will be blessed. It's not the hearer of the word. It's the doer of the word. And we forget ladies, you know, it says also in the book of Hebrews that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay. I want to please God. Do you want to please God? Then we have to have faith and faith believes something 
but then acts, all right? And so it says that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. God loves to reward. And there's no greater reward than his presence and knowing that God is with you. Have you ever had that feeling where you are like in God's pocket? It's the most thrilling, exciting thing. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Wow, I was supposed to pray first. Okay, let's, let's <laughs> bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you for this day. It's a beautiful day, Lord. This is a day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we are so grateful that because of your amazing plan of salvation that you have placed us in Christ, and you've made provision where we can abide in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for him. We worship you, Lord. And I'd ask today, Lord, that you would open our spiritual eyes and ears, that we might see you in a, in a bigger, more realistic way, and that we might fall in love with you, as Dr. Mitchell says. Lord, bless us as we study your word. And again, just uh, let us see something new and exciting about you today. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, now I am, let's see, how do I want to do this? Oh, first of all, did everybody get this little, well, it's like a four page handout. Somebody asked me, I told you the story last time where my, my I wanted to drop the, the professor's class. I was an English major and I had the class where my professor was so antagonistic to Christians. We began 15 minutes of every class was running down Christians and mocking them and how, how stupid we were and so foolish. And so I went to my father, I had, I had already, um, I, I was not raised in a Christian home and I was, um, I was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was lost and I was bad and I needed a savior. And, um, that's why Christ died for me. Praise God. So anyway, when I came to the Lord, um, I was, and I tell people my testimony, I was the poster child of bitterness. If you'd asked me, I would have told you I hated my father, hated my mother, and I had secretly planned to uh, graduate from high school and then get out of there. I was not going to have that man rule over me anymore. And thankfully, God had another plan and intervened because my mom and dad accepted Christ and they were just transformed. And the thing that made me, that drew me, um, that, that God used to draw me to himself was my father um, talking to all six of us children. He put the three girls in one room and the three boys in the other room. And we, again, we were such a bitter family. We were a dysfunctional family. Um, I cried myself to sleep so many nights because I did not feel loved or understood or appreciated. My dad never gave me a birthday gift, never gave me a Christmas gift, didn't come to my graduation. Uh, he was just an emotionally absent father. And um, so he's, he, he, he and my mother had gotten saved. And so he said, we want to talk. Well, the six kids that we'd already had a little powwow because we were not a family that talked. And so we thought it can only be one of two things, either daddy's dying of cancer or mother's pregnant again. And so um, we were gl gloriously surprised because my my, the door opened and my dad came in first and I've asked you to picture him. He was a huge man. That's why I'm so big. He was like six, four, weighed about 300 pounds, looked a lot like John Wayne. I'd never, ever seen my dad cry. And I, you know, ever. Well, my dad walked into the room first and he walked over and he got down on his knees in front of the three, three, the three girls and began to weep. And I remember thinking, that's it. He's fixing to tell us that he's got cancer. And we were utterly amazed when instead he said um, that I heard the gospel and I have accepted Christ as my savior and God has convicted me that I have failed as a father. And my jaw came unhinged. And my first thought, you know, the book of James says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the grace was flying in that room as my father humbled himself because my first thought was there is a God. I have always wondered if God is real. And now I know he is because he's humbled a proud man. And so that began my search to find out about this God who had whooped up on my father. 
and totally changed him. He became a different man. And so um, the Lord began doing a work in my heart. And I learned that our, our natural inclinations are usually the exact opposite of what God would have us do. And so I began thinking about, you know, my plan was to get out of here and get away from authority. But one of the, the, the things that convicted me that I was a sinner is I did not know the Ten Commandments. I didn't know the fifth one was honor your parents. Well, boy, I certainly had failed at that one. And so I, my father had asked my forgiveness and the Lord got me to that place where I went to my father and I asked his forgiveness for failing as a daughter. I said, I had no idea that God required that I honor you and honor mother. And I have not done that. And I said, would you forgive me? And then I said, I did not learn what I was supposed to learn the first 18 years in the home. Could I get back under your authority and learn what I didn't learn? I certainly didn't have character. And I really thought my dad would say, you know, again, he had no involvement in my life. And I thought he would say, no, that's okay. We've had enough of you. <laughs> Why don't you move out? And instead, my dad became a drill sergeant. He told me when to get up, when to go to bed, what job I was going to take. It, it was like the hardest, I thought at that time, the hardest thing in my life. And it was like God, I'd get along with God and he'd say, I'm, I'm seeing if you really mean business. Uh, are you really going to submit your will to me? And that's what I want to talk about today. And I'd like to use, if you don't mind, some of my personal testimony. This is certainly not to toot my horn because a lot of it is through failure. Um, and God helping me correct failure in my life. Um, but in that, in that chapter 14, I, I was, because I was not raised in the church, there were some things that they were a blessing because I didn't have the trappings of the church. Because in the church, I've seen a lot of churches, what they do to make disciples um, is they, and, you, and we're learning so much in John about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. All right. And we, and there, there are three, Dr. Mitchell talks about them. There are three evidences that the book of John mentions that says, this will prove that you really are my disciple. Okay. Do you remember what they are? One was in today's chapter. They'll know you're my disciples by you bear much fruit. One is that you love one another. Okay. You love one another, you bear much fruit, and the other one is you'll continue in my word. Okay, I know of very few discipleship programs that that's the top three things on their list. Usually, what do we do? We take a brand new believer and we fill them with what? Head knowledge, doctrine. It's what seminaries are famous for. And we don't realize that if you take a fairly new believer, and you fill them with head knowledge, you've just created a Pharisee. Okay, that's not God's order. You know, I used to think because when you look at the Old Testament, I know it sounds like I'm rambling, but there is a point to this. In the Old Testament, when God delivered and birthed the nation of Israel and brought them out of Egypt, out of bondage, that the New Testament tells us that was a picture of like a sinner getting saved. Egypt was a picture of the world. Pharaoh would be a picture of who? The devil, okay? And we're in bondage to sin. And God delivers them. The whole Passover is a picture of Christ. They were to shed the Passover lamb and put the blood over the doorpost. And when the angel of death saw the blood of the lamb, death would pass over. Okay, that is a picture of a believer putting their faith and trust in the sacrificial death of Christ. His blood is over us, and therefore God's judgment and wrath pass us by. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, but then he is going to take them out of bondage and take them to the land of promise, right? And normally we would think, I thought as I was studying the Bible when I was a new believer, then, then I know the next thing God is going to do. He's going to pass through the Red Sea, and they're going to go right to Mount Sinai, and he's going to give them the law. 
Is that what he did? No, you know what he did? They went through trials. They, they went through trouble and affliction. They went without water and they murmured and they complained because second Peter tells us God's order is to your faith, you should add virtue, moral excellence. That's God's order. Then when a person has character, then you can give them knowledge. If you give knowledge to a unsavory person, it just makes them proud. And we have a lot of proud pastors, okay, who don't have character. And I'm not naming any names, <laughs> okay? And, but for believers, the same. And so we should remember this too when we're raising children. If we want to raise disciples for Christ, lead them to faith, but then teach them character. And so I really believe that's what my boot camp, my spiritual boot camp, the Lord was saying, Kathy, you didn't learn character the first 18 years. And I shared with you, I was a liar. I was a thief. You know, I shared with you, did I share the one about stealing from my cousin? Did I share that one? Okay, but the point I want to make, and I will get back to some of these stories, because what I didn't know that I was doing at the time, or what God was doing in my life, is I was being obedient, or learning to be obedient to the commands of Christ. Okay, it is so important that we honor our parents. It's repeated in Ephesians, it's in Colossians, it says, Honor your parents, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing to him. And remember, it's the first commandment with a promise. And what was the promise? Things will go well for you. And I've often wondered, Lord, why is that? Because there are some really unsavory parents out there, really hard to be obedient to. It's not for their sake, it's for your sake. Because what I learned is God is trying to build a relationship with each child that we are so, like it talks about in our chapter today, we are so one with him and so desirous to please him that when he says jump, we jump. And when he says stop, we stop. And when he says go, we go. Okay. And we're not by nature like that. Right. Self tends to be on the throne. And so what God was teaching me was that passage in 14 and 15. If you want to experience the presence of God, that, that intimate, joyful fellowship, then you have to yield self, let Christ be the boss, okay, and be obedient. And so I was learning how to honor my father and mother and be obedient, and it was hard. It goes against the grain. And so I, I went from this dad, like I said, who never told me anything. I asked him in high school, do you want to screen the fellows I date? No, I don't care. Do you want to have me to have a curfew? No, I don't care. Okay, what did that communicate to me? My, I'm not important. I'm not valuable. All right. And so, but the Lord told me, and this, I'm going to, in Matthew 18, I think is the definitive passage on forgiveness. But as I'm studying the word of God and I'm there and I'm under my parents' authority and I read that we have to forgive, that is one of the commands of Christ. Do you know that? Ladies, he doesn't ask us, do you want to? He says, you have to. It is a command, forgive. Because again, what I learned is whenever Christ gives a command, it is always pointing to passive life. Bitterness, it was bitterness that was destroying me. But Satan tried to tell me bitterness was a good thing. You, you get revenge or you, you get one up your dad, whatever. But he's a liar. Forgiveness. And so I forgave my dad. And God blesses. Whenever you're obedient, God, it says in the Psalms that God has exalted his word above his name. And God loves it. If you exalt his word by doing it, you will be the one that is blessed. Um, so that was one of the things. And one day I came in from school 
I was going to UNT and I walked in after classes and my dad was sitting there and he looked at me from his recliner and he looked at me and he got this, he's, you're so lazy. And you know what my first almost came out of my mouth? The old Kathy? Well, that's what you think of me? You want to hear what I think of you? Okay, but the Holy Spirit said, wait, 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 wait. Remember, you're in spiritual boot camp. What would Jesus do? And so I thought, how can I honor my father? So I went over and I sat down by him and I said, Daddy, you said that so convincingly. There must, but I don't think of myself as a lazy person. So you must see something I don't see. You know, I help mother around the house. I cook, I clean. You know, how am I lazy? And my dad said, oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean that, like that. I meant like this. And we had a two-hour discussion. One of, it's what I always longed for, was a dad who would talk to me. And if I had responded in the flesh, we'd had a big fight. But God loves humility. And a soft answer turns away wrath. And it was a character issue that I did have that I needed to correct. And I thought many times God sent a message to us, but we don't like the messenger he uses. But we have to be willing to say, Lord, this from your hand. That I was at home for eight more years, okay? 10 more years. I was at home with my parents until I got married. And it was the most glorious time because God became so real to me. And so as we're thinking about the chapter today, what does it mean to abide in Christ? That I want to flesh that out because I did not know that what I was doing at home was abiding in Christ. Is where you are so conscious every minute of his presence and his involvement in your life. And you're feeding on him and you're delighting in him. He was so real to me all the time. And so every, whether every problem, whatever it was, and I remember my second year, my dad had told me I always wanted to travel. And my dad never, we never took vacations. We never traveled because he couldn't leave the cows. You, you can't get a babysitter for the cows. <laughs> he was a cattle rancher. And so ever in our vacations. And um, so my dad had said, if you stick, keep up your studies and you make straight A's, I'll let you go to Europe. Well, that's what I wanted to do. So the, after my first year, six weeks went with one of my best friends from high school who also attended UNT, who was not a believer, because I was a fairly brand new believer. And then a dear, dear friend who was Orthodox Jew. And the three of us went on a trip. Now I'd never been out of Texas and we got a URL pass and we just went all over Europe for six weeks. And I kept trying to witness to these two friends that did not know Christ. And um, so one of the things, as we were traveling, we were on the train and um, we, some Americans came through and we were on our way. We were, I think we were in Milan and we were on our way to Rome. And they, they just kept saying, is the, the, the thievery in Rome is horrible. You, you hold your purse cross body, always have your hand on it. They will knock you down and snatch your purse. They'll steal your luggage. It's just horrible. Well, we were so agitated and upset everywhere we went that I thought, this is ruining my trip. I'm so worrying about this luggage getting stolen that it's ruining my trip. So as we're on the train and I have my Bible, I was reading in Matthew, where again, we don't recognize the commands of Christ, but I told you they're over 40. Okay, and we need to know them because we have to do them if we want to experience the presence of God in our life. And so one of them was be anxious for nothing. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And it says, don't lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. And I said, Lord, this is so true. 
I'm so anxious and worried about this treasure I'm learning. What I was learning is that's why God doesn't want us to own anything. Because what we own soon owns us. I wasn't enjoying it. It was ruining my trip with worry and anxiety. Does this make any sense? I've always heard a funny thing about boat owners. The two greatest days in a boat owner's life is the day they buy it and the day they sell it. Why? Because it's a lot of worry and trouble. Okay. And so as I'm sitting there on the train thinking, and I said, well, Lord, what, what is the remedy for that? I'm reading this passage and it was trust in God. God takes care of the, the flowers of the field and the birds of the air trust. And so I was sitting there on the train and I said, Lord, and again, I hope you hear my heart. This is not about me. This is about how great our God is and how he loves. One of my favorite verses is 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. God desires to show that he's real. He wants you to know that he's real. And so I was there and I said, you know what I'm going to do, Lord? I'm just going to give my luggage to you right now. I'm going to try to be the best steward of it I can be, but I'm going to give you ownership of my luggage so that I can just quit worrying about it. And I'm just going to rest in you. So I don't know why, but I told my friends, I said, you know, this, this worrying about our luggage, it's just ruining the trip. And so I, I just gave my luggage to God. Again, both of them are not believers. And the little Jewish girl said, you did what? <laughs> and I said, I know that sounds strange. I said, but look, I'm reading this passage here about not worrying and trusting God. And so I'm going to transfer ownership of my luggage to God. And they looked at each other and rolled their eyes. And so anyway, we kept traveling. So we, we had to spend the night on the train and we had a compartment and we had a little stop before we got to Rome. And so we'd been there all night. So we got off and you, I don't know if you've ever traveled in Europe on a train, but you can get stepped down and there's a vendor right there and you can buy something to eat and drink and whatever. So we bought a little something and we got back up. We had not been gone five minutes and we opened our compartment door and up on a rack where you put their luggage, everybody's luggage was stolen but mine. And we had them all mixed in. We each had a suitcase and a carry-on and they'd all been mixed in. And there was my suitcase and my carry-on and theirs were gone. And boy, you talk about weeping and wailing and crying and they had to call the police and the police came in and we didn't speak Italian and they kept saying, you don't understand, they took it away. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to, we had to go to the police station and fill out a report and we were all crying and we were oh, so, so upset. And I remember sitting over there and I remember thinking, you, you did it. You did it. And then I thought, why did you do it? You know, I, I'm not, I'm not one whit better than them. And he said, but you're my child. If you gave me something, you gave me your luggage. And I want you to know, Kathy, that this is the conversation I was having in my spirit with the Lord. I want you to know that I can take care of my own. Now you see, Kathy that I can take care of your luggage. Why don't you give me your future? Why don't you give me your friends? Why don't you give me your career? Why don't you give me your goals and dreams? Why don't you give me your money? Why don't you give me your time? And I said, I can do that. I can yield because what he's after is a yielded heart. That's what he wants. You know, when God went after Abraham and said, give me your son, he didn't want his son. What did he want? He wanted because his son was his most treasured thing. And that's, we are such a treasure to God. He's jealous over us. He wants that fellowship. He wants that yieldedness. 
And so that is what he was after. And then I have to, sh to share with you because it, it sounds like everything goes perfect. But on that trip, we were gone six weeks. I kept trying to witness to my friends. I blew it. I blew it. I so wounded that Jewish girl, her heart. And so when I got home, hadn't heard from her. Now, you, when you travel with a good friend for six weeks and then you don't hear from them. And so I'm reading in Matthew and it says, if you're bringing your gift to the altar and there you remember that someone has ought against you, leave your gift and go and be reconciled to your brother. Ladies, do y'all do that? That is not a suggestion. It's a command. It's one of those 40 commands. This doesn't have anything to do with doctrine. This is talking about where the rubber meets the road, living with Christ. And so I wrestled. I didn't want to do that. That was humbling. But then you know what the Lord reminded me? The impact. What brought me seeking the Lord? What changed my heart and made me want to go after God? It was my father humbling himself and saying, I have failed. And I thought, Lord, I have to do it. You've commanded me as much as I don't want to do it. So I had to call her in Dallas. We lived here, went to see her. And there was a wall. I had wounded her. And so I asked her forgiveness for my lack of love and the way that I shared and that she was very important to me. And that I hoped that someday she would see Christ in me because she sure didn't see it on that trip. And please pray for her. We are still friends. And I got together with her a couple of months ago. And she said, you know, you're the only real Christian I've ever met. Because you asked my forgiveness when you hurt me. Ladies, we all should be demonstrating Christ. How do we, how did Jesus, we've studied this in our book of John. How did Jesus reveal the father? Remember, it says multiple times, three or four times in John, no man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he hath shown him forth. And remember what he told um, Philip, Philip said, show us the father. And what did Jesus say? Philip. Have I been with you so long and you still don't get it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he said, the words that I speak are the Father's words. I'll always do the things that please him. His works and his words revealed God to us. Well, in the same way, how is an unbelieving world going to know that Jesus is real? Because we have to let him live through us as we speak his words and we have his heart attitudes and his love for the lost. Then they will look at us and say, I've seen Jesus. That's how it should be. That is our chapter today. Abiding in Christ. Is this making sense? It, and, and the abiding and Christ being demonstrated it's all tied in with knowing the word of God and doing the word of God. It was so clear in chapter 14, and it's going to be so clear in chapter 15. So if you'll get out your questions, and we're going to start with that. Um, let me just, I'd like to share, again, I hope this is not too personal. I'd like to share some stories because I don't know a better way of demonstrating what this looks like. But when I lived at home, I had a sister, an older sister who was not a believer, and she came to me and she said, you're, you're going to have to quit doing what you're doing. And I said, what, what is it I'm doing? And she said, being obedient to mom and dad. And I said, why? And she said, because you're going to rot on that farm and be an old maid. And you're going to be, you know, in your 70s and they're in their 90s and they're going to be living their life through you. You're going to be stuck out here cleaning and taking care of them. Okay, now she did not have a picture, a wonderful plan for my life. <laughs> and, the, and the more 
the more she talked, the more worried I got. <laughs> so I got alone. I got alone with the Lord and I prayed and, and uh, I said, okay, Lord, that's my sister's view of things. What is your view of things? And as I got in the word and I, and, and this is what abiding is part of abiding is asking Christ to give us the mind of Christ. If you look at your diagram, the three circle chart, um, for, the, for the ladies that are new, this little three circle chart, I hope you'll spend time on this. First of all, you have to fold it in half. That's why that line is there. Um, let me just spend a few minutes reviewing this. I, des I, divined, I designed this chart for my children. I was homeschooling my children and I wanted them to understand what happens to a person when they accept Christ. Now, this is not a Christian, it's not, it's not somebody that just goes to church. You can study the Bible. You can be very religious and be in the church and not be a believer. You know, I quote it all the time. Corey Tim Boom's dad said, just cause the mouse is in the cookie jar doesn't make him a cookie. Going to church does not make you a Christian. Doing Christian things does not make you a Christian. And so this is a picture I was trying to show my kids of what the unsafe person looks like. And so I came up with the three circles is a picture of our spirit, our soul, and our body. And the, the verses over here, I hope you'll spend time. This is a wonderful activity. This will make you fall in love with the Lord is look up these verses because these are what the, the verses say about the unsaved man. One of the passages there, it is not there. Would you put it there? Is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Because in the book of that first book of Corinthians, Paul in writing to the people at Corinth, he makes this statement in chapter two, and then it goes on into verse uh, chapter three. He said, there are three kinds of people in the world and you have to be one of those three. God makes it very easy, mm -hmm. all right? And the first one that Paul mentions is the natural man. That is this man right here. This is this man apart from God. What do we look like to God? And, as, and, it, and what Paul says about the natural man is he cannot know the things of God because in order to know the things of God, they have to be spiritually discerned and the unsaved person's spirit is dead. That's what the New Testament says about the unsaved man. I wanted my boys to see how bad we are apart from Christ. We are in a lot of trouble because the gospel is called the good news. You won't appreciate the good news until you first know how bad the bad news is. Okay, because the natural man, we come out of our mother's womb, alienated from God. Okay, uh, David said, I was conceived in sin and born in iniquity. <clears throat> it doesn't mean his mother did something bad. It means that because I'm in Adam, when Adam fell in the garden, it corrupted all of his seed. And we are all born God's enemy is what the scriptures say. We are born sinners. We're, we come out of the womb sinners. It's not that like the world says, you, your, your environment corrupts you. Okay, we come out corrupt and evil and therefore we do evil things. The Bible makes it clear that birth determines what you are. Okay, a bird doesn't fly and that makes it it's a bird. It's born a bird and therefore it flies. Is this making sense? That means we're born a sinner and therefore we commit sin. Now, the wonderful thing about Jesus, it says he knew no sin. He did no sin. And in our chapter said there's the last week, there was nothing in him to which Satan could make an appeal. He was sinless, blameless. That's why he's called the second Adam. Because the first Adam is bad. So if you look up these verses, and this, the kingdom that we're born into, we're born into Adam's family, and but the, there's a, a prince of this world. And the Bible, in the book of John, Jesus does never refer to Satan as Satan or the devil. He calls him the prince of the power of the air. 
when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned and they fell and broke communion with God, okay, the whole world fell. And Satan, man was intended, he was created and put in the garden to have dominion over the earth, but he lost it and Satan got it by default. So now he is the prince. And the, some of these verses, as you'll see in Ephesians, it says that he blinds the eyes and the minds of the non-believers. They don't even know that they're doing Satan's bidding. All right. So that we're in a bad state. It says the spirit is darkened. The mind also is corrupted. The mind is darkened. The will is corrupted and the emotions are led by deception. I read a, a quote not too long ago by a famous counselor and he said, most of the misery in our life is caused by lies we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. okay. One of the lies that made me so miserable was I'm not worth anything because my, my father doesn't value me. Does my father's estimation determine my worth? No, the Bible says God determines my worth. And he says, you're worth the death of my only son. He has placed a great value on each of us. We have to believe what he says, not what the enemy tries to tell us. Okay, Mickey, you look like you have a question. Okay, all right, anybody? Okay, so our spirit is dead, our soul is darkened, and our body now is decaying. I can see that every time I look in the mirror. <laughs> it, it's getting better. It's going down, all right? And so over here, I have on this side that the world, Satan's kingdom, and we need to know this because in our, in our chapter 15 today, we're going to talk about the world and also in the next chapter, Satan's kingdom is a political, theological, financial, educational, and philosophical world system that is opposed to God. Satan will use any deceptive means to get us to side with him against God because he hates his subjects because they are created in the image of God. <clears throat> so behind the world exists an invisible but very real power. Satan's power is behind this world. <clears throat> you don't have to watch the news very long to see this. All right. And his influence permeates everything. And just like you look at the, the Pharisees, can you have um, a religious system that is opposed to God? Very much so, okay? All right, so I explained to my children, this is the, 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 the state of the unsaved man. This is what we look like to God apart from Christ. And I said, now, what are we going to do about this? And God says in his word, there are two ways to get to God. Now, this uh, that sounds like blasphemy, and it is, but hang with me, um, because I'm explaining this to my children. According to the scripture, uh, there are two ways a man can get to God. And it's interesting because I've shared this also. My husband, when he was a, a, a director of admissions at a Christian school, it was his job to determine if one of the parents was a believer. Because in order to get their kids in the Christian school, at least one parent had to be a believer. So he got paid to share the gospel. He loved it. And he said, Kathy, it happens 100% of the time. Every time I'm talking to a parent who thinks they're a believer, but they're not. And I asked them that question. If you were to, you know, perish the thought, but let's say you were to leave this office and go on your way home and you're in a car accident and you're killed and you're standing before God in the pearly gates and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? What does a non-believer say? I've been a good person. I've tried to be a good person. A hundred percent. Okay, that's what the lost mind thinks. They don't think they're that bad. Now, whether they're comparing themselves to Hitler or who, I don't know, but they, they think I will, I will get in because I've tried to be a good person. Can we find that in the Bible? No, no. 
The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth righteousness, no, not one. Their mouth is an open sepulcher. Okay, we are in a bad state. So I said, that is like one of the two ways that logistically you could get into heaven, I'm telling my children, is you can be just as good as God. You want to try that? <laughs> I said, you know what that would be like, boys? I said, that would be like if I told you you could get to heaven and all you have to do is in one jump, flat jump, from here to New York. And you can get into heaven. And they said, well, mommy, we can't do it. And I said, well, then praise God, there's a plan B. <laughs> okay? Because nobody can be as good as God. And if we're to stand before a righteous, holy God and be okay, we have to have a righteousness that's equal to his. And so the good news is that God came up with a plan B. And as we're talking in our chapter three of John, remember he says to Nicodemus, this is a perfect, Nicodemus came as an unsaved person and he sought out Jesus in chapter three in the night because he wanted a little private talk with him. And he said, I know that you come from God because nobody could say the things that you say unless God be with him. Now, I thought Jesus would give him a pat on the back for that little speech. And instead, Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you're born wrong. You can't even see spiritual reality. You can't see the kingdom of heaven, much less get into it unless you're born again. There's the plan B. And so Nicodemus, did he get it? No, it went right over his head. And he said, what? Can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And, and Jesus explained, Nicodemus, you have to be born of the spirit. And so ladies, the minute you and I admit to God, I can't flat jump from here to New York in one jump. There's no way I can achieve heaven on my own effort. It's impossible. So Lord, if I don't receive Christ, then I am going to hell. That's what I was confronted with there after when, when I heard the gospel, after my father had had such a transformation. And I realized my focus had always been on my dad sure is a bad sinner. He sure is a bad person until the spotlight was on me. And I went, oh, my goodness, I have violated the law of God. I'm a hell deserving sinner. And so I cried out and I said, Jesus, I recognize that when you died on the cross, you died for my sins in my place so that I could be right with God. And then you gifted me your righteousness if I receive it. And I said, Lord, I receive it personally for myself and I'm born again. And the most amazing thing, just like he told Nicodemus, when the, the minute, that next second, the Holy Spirit comes in and a complete transformation takes place. And the Bible says, now I can see spiritual reality for the first time. And not only that, I've been taken out of this family and I have been birthed into a new family. And so now I'm in Christ and so I'm in God's family and this is God's kingdom and he has a whole new set of rules. <clears throat> now, you know, what's funny is I hated my father down here when I was in this state and I got saved and I still hated my father. Did it not work? Oh no, it worked. Okay. Because the Bible says that immediately when the Holy spirit comes in, my spirit is reborn. And Corinthians, second Corinthians says, I am a new creature in Christ. This, which was dead. My spirit down here was dead. And what was the spirit designed for? Do you remember when Adam God would come to Adam in the cool of the evening in Genesis in the garden. And what would they do? They would walk together and talk. This thing that was made so that I could commune with God down here was rendered inoperative. But now it's reborn and I can commune with the living God. His spirit dwells in my spirit. He's in me and I'm in him. Shouldn't we just praise him? Okay. All right. So this has been reborn. But you know what? This transformation was not enough 
to transform my soul, my mind, my will, and emotions. Okay, because God is not going to force Christ's thoughts on me. What does he plead with me in Philippians? Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So sanctification, abiding, is when we let God transform our thoughts, our will, and our emotions. And that was what God was doing with me in that boot camp. I was learning, don't respond like you used to respond down here. You respond with the mind of Christ, but you have to be in the word to know the mind of Christ, right? To know the commands, to know, oh my gosh, down here, I hate it. But a characteristic of the heavenly man is that I, I love to forgive. Do you know, it shocked me how many times I had read the story of the prodigal son until God showed me one day in that picture, the father represents God. And where is God the father when the prodigal son starts referring, returning? Where is the father? Waiting there for him. And when he sees him, he runs to him. You know what God showed me? Kathy, I love to forgive. I am always poised to forgive. It's just an ask away. Can you be like that? I said, oh, Lord, I don't know. <laughs> Remember, I'm kind of the poster child of editors. I'm mad at everybody. <laughs> and he said, you can change. You can change because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Holy Spirit is the most powerful agent for change in the universe. Do we believe that? Amen. Then let him transform us. Let us have the mind of Christ. Let us be forgiving. Let us, when we wound somebody, go and make it right. If you remember your brother has ought against you, go and make it right so that they don't think ill of God. Don't let him get blamed for your lack of character. Okay, so he we, that is what we are doing now. And the glorious part is when salvation is complete and we're in heaven, we're also going to get a new body, a heavenly body. It's going to be glorious. All right? Yep. Now, why was I telling you that? <laughs> I know it had. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. <laughs> it, is good. <laughs> it is good stuff. One thing I, I, I want to share, my, my husband gave me this, and I thought that was so, how many of you know who Martin Luther is? It's kind of started the Reformation, which um, was a Reformation of the error in the Catholic Church. He was a Catholic monk in Germany. And as a monk, he wrestled and wrestled because he would read about the righteousness of God. And of course, he was unsaved, even though he was a monk. And he wrestled and he'd read about the righteousness of God and he hated it in Romans. In Romans 1, it says, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And he hated God. And they asked him, do you love God? And he said, no, I hate God. Because he's, he's demanding a standard that I cannot achieve. Okay, until this, and this is what he says. Martin Luther at first thought that the righteousness of God, which Paul is mentioning in Romans 3, was the righteousness that God required of us in perfectly fulfilling his law. Because remember, it says, the soul that it shall die. And James says, if you break one commandment, then you've broke the law. So you're guilty before God. What, a, what an impending standard. Again, it's like jump from here to New York in one jump. You can't do it. And so it says, because Luther realized more and more he could not possibly measure up to that impossible demand, he grew increasingly angry with God. At one time he explained, love God? No, I hate him. But eventually he came to realize as he's studying the word of God, that the righteousness of God, which Paul is talking about, is the righteousness that God imparts to us that he credits to our account. Thereupon, I felt myself reborn and I went right through the doors into paradise. What then is this righteousness that's from God that Paul announced to us and over which Martin Luther struggled? 
It's a righteousness that God both requires. He requires us to be righteous, but then he provides it for us. It's as if he said, ladies, you know what? You can't make the jump. I'll make it for you. And then I'm going to join you to me. So now you made the jump. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? It's a righteousness that God both requires because it must satisfy his demands of the law, both in its precepts and its penalty. For although this righteousness is apart from the law, as far as we're concerned, it is not apart from the law as far as God is concerned. Rather, it must be a righteousness that both perfectly fulfills the righteous requirements of his law and satisfies the demands of his justice towards those who have broken his law. The right, this righteousness from God then is nothing less than the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, who through his sinless life and death in obedience to the Father's will, perfectly fulfilled the law of God in both its precepts and its penalties. In other words, the righteousness that God both requires and provides embraces all the work of Christ. Okay, and we have been reconciled to God because of that. So that's why I love Dr. Mitchell's commentary on the book of Romans is entitled Right with God. The minute we receive Christ, we are right with God. But now he wants to, I and mean, I told you the other thing is Dr. Mitchell used to say, you know why when we, the minute we get saved and we belong to, remind me to go back to the topic, Mickey, you're good at reminding me, Corey Tim Boom concentration camp. Okay, I'll forget that story. Um, but now where was I? Oh, Dr. Mitchell would say, wouldn't it be wonderful if the minute we got saved, God just beamed us on up to heaven? Wouldn't that be wonderful? wouldn't have to go through trials wouldn't have to go through sorrows get to be with Jesus wouldn't that be wonderful Dr. Mitchell said it's so wonderful that there are times I've thought about when I'm baptizing a new believer just hold them under <laughs> and just send, send them on to glory and uh, he said but then why in the world right Corinthians says we're ambassadors and that's a great term what do ambassadors do they belong to this country, but they live down here, right? They're citizens of another country, but they live in this country and they represent the country they're from, right? The sad thing is we get so at home down here, we forget we're ambassadors for Christ and we're, we're trying to win them out of this kingdom and get them to become members of this kingdom, citizens of this kingdom. That is why we're here. And so what we learned today about abiding is abiding is where we so are one with Jesus and we, we feed on him and we, we're in the word and we have the mind of Christ that we're exuding Jesus. And, you know, I love that saying that all men, unsaved men, are either going to be like cockroaches or moths. Some run from the light, but moths are drawn to the light. And there will be those that we draw to Christ, okay, as ambassadors, and we encourage them. That's what Paul said, be reconciled to be God, become citizens of heaven, okay? And that is why we're here. How are we doing at representing Christ? Do we look like Jesus? Um, one of the stories I was going to talk about, Corey Ten Boom, I, if you've never read The Hiding Place, I love that book. Have y'all read that? Anybody read that? Okay, I was rereading that not too long ago, and, and it, it made me think of this diagram. When they were in this concentration camp, I mean, like a pinnacle of hellishness. In fact, uh, the sister Betsy said to Corey, Corey, we're in hell. We're in hell. I can't even imagine what it was like. But Corey Tim Boom, in her book, she said, you know, the easiest thing when you're in a concentration camp is to get a concentration camp mentality. And she said, when we first came into the concentration camp, we, we were really focused on ministering to the other women there. And we would share, whether it was medicine, blankets, whatever. But as time went on, you get this mentality of me. It's about me. And I thought, this is like a, a microcosm of my life. 
And so she said um, they, they had passed out blankets to all of the inmates in, in the um, bunk where the, where the ward they were in. And then right after that, like eight new women came in and they were prostitutes. And those women came in and she said, my, my sister Betsy said to me, Corey, let's share a blanket and you give, you will share my blanket and you give your blanket to one of those women. And she said, I said, no, I want a blanket. Okay, so she's saying how easy it is. And I thought, ladies, if ever God was gonna suspend his kingdom rules, because you know, a kingdom has rules that it functions by, okay? And God's rules are different than the world's rules, than Satan's rules. And I thought, but if God is ever going to suspend them, surely it would be for those two little old maid spinster ladies who are in hell. Surely she could have her blanket. And you know what she says? When that happened, you know what else happened? My joy dried up. The presence of Christ dried up. She said, prior to that, we'd been having Bible studies, winning people to Christ in the barracks, but all that dried up. My joy dried up, my ministry dried up. And then the Lord started talking to me. Just because you're here, you have to live by my rules. I love people, you love people. And in, in our chapter today, we learn how did Jesus show his love for the father obedience i do always the things that please him i only say the words he wants me to say and in the last chapter of 14 he says so that the world will know that i love the father let's get up and go to the garden of gethsemane because i have to die okay christ showed his love for god by obedience how did he show his love for us sacrifice it's the same for us how do we show our love for god obedience how will we show our love for others sacrifice and so Corey said when god shook me a little then i said that's right and she said we had, we had had this little um vial of vitamins that they would give to the women in the barracks that were pregnant and she said it was opaque and we never could you know figure out how much was in there, but it just kept going and going and going. We just kept seeing more, like the, the widow's, you know, vial of oil, it just kept going. She goes, but when I got selfish, it dried up. And then when the Lord shook me and I said, Lord, right, I am here as an ambassador. You may have me in a very unattractive country, but I've got to represent you. And so she said, we shared the blanket. We started sharing the food and whatever. And she said, my joy returned. Can you have joy in the midst of horrible circumstances? You sure can when you're in God's pocket. Okay, God was real to her. She said, people started coming to Christ again. I had the joy of the presence of the Lord. And so that's what abiding is. But it's so tied up with knowing the word of God and doing the word of God and spending time in the word, looking for Jesus. Another thing I've learned, ladies, is Jesus is the treasure. He is the treasure, all right? And the word is the treasure map. That's how you find him. That's how you know him, what he's like. And are you having that experience? Um, I remember one, one time, my father um, came in in this boot camp and I was going to uh, UNT as a full-time student, but I had the summers off and my dad just walked into no prep, no warning. And he just said, um, my grandmother was in a nursing home and we had a full-time caregiver that stayed with her. And my dad said, I've given her the summer off you're on. <laughs> Asked me, do you want, would you like to do that? Do you have any summer plans? Nothing. Okay. But again, I learned that, okay, God, you, I don't have to sin to 
that is not what I would have chosen this summer. But evidently, this is what you want me to do. And I want to have this. All right. And do you remember there was something that Jesus once didn't want to do? He was talking and disputing, teaching, and they marveled at his wisdom. And remember, Mary and Joseph had started on back home and he was missing and came back and they kind of, don't you know you scared the people out of us? That's the text. Of um, and he said, what? Don't you know about my father's business? Now he already felt the call to life to be doing, but what does it say about Jesus? He went home and he submitted himself to them and he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It pleased God that he followed the fifth commandment. All right. And so I said, okay, Lord, why do you want me to go stay at the nursing home with my mother? And there were tons of things I learned. I mean, I'd always been kind of afraid of nursing homes and uh, it was really good character building. But one of the things that the Lord prompted me is, Kathy, you don't really know if your grandmother's going to heaven. Why don't you share Christ with her? Why don't you have the joy of leading your grandmother to Christ? Maybe that's why God wants me here. Okay, ladies, it, that is such an exciting way. God is orchestrating every part of your life when you're yielded to him. Okay, nobody. So like my sister, you know, who gave me that pronouncement of doom and gloom. Um, I got sidetracked. So I went upstairs, you know, you're going to rot on this farm and be an old maid. And I went upstairs and I got before the Lord and I was praying and I said, Lord, that that's terrifying. You know, I don't want to be, you know, trapped out here. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, no, wait a minute. Wait. A minute. Am I the God of the universe? You are. Am I bigger than your sister? Yes, you are. Am I bigger than your mom and dad? Yes. Then if you're totally yielded to me. I will get you right where I want you. You don't, you know what I learned, ladies? There's so few people that are totally surrendered to Christ for one to rock. You know, even John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, it's the most widely read Christian book next to the Bible. He was in prison for years. And yet that's where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And when it was time for him to get out of jail, he said, I don't know if I want to go. This has been the richest, sweetest time with Jesus. I don't know if I want to get out. I don't want to lose that. I want, I want to have that experience of Christ. And so I rededicated my life to the Lord. And I said, that is right, Lord, if I'm really yielded to you, you can't afford to let me rot here. And so that was when about two weeks later, my dad said, okay, you're going to Bible college. I said, I am. He said, yeah, you're going to go to Oral Roberts. I think I shared this with you. And I remember thinking, I don't think God wants me to go to Oral Roberts. I don't have the same theology doctrinally as them, but you know, Lord, again, I don't have to sin to get your will done. And so my dad, we took off, we drove up there, we looked at the school and I, Lord, if you want me to go to this school, you change my heart. If you don't want me to go, you change my father's heart. And so we were driving back. My dad jerked the car on the side of the road. I thought we were in a car accident. And he said, you're not going. I said, I'm not. And I, I met the people, they love Jesus. I thought I could be happy there. And uh, he said, you're not going there. And I said, well, where am I going? And he goes, I don't know, but God will show us. And then it was not too long after that, we were at the First Baptist Church in Denton, and Bruce Wilkinson was doing a walk through the Bible. And he mentioned Multnomah, the Bible college where he was a professor. And I saw the light come on in my dad's eyes. And I thought that that's where I'm going. And God got me to that school. And I remember, you know, here, my sister had never been out of Texas and I was going off to a university in Oregon for three years. And while I was there, I'd always been in the band and, but I thought I'm choir. So I tried out for the choir. I didn't really know that, that I had a nice voice. And so they uh, hired me to sing on the radio with Dr. Mitchell. So Dr. Mitchell. 
So I was in a recording studio there in Portland, sitting on one of those stools with the earphones recording and everything. And I remember thinking, I wonder if my sister could see me now. <laughs> what she what think? Because it wasn't true. Okay. It wasn't true. The best place to be is yielded to Christ. And so when I graduated and came home, I was contacted by the school and they said, if you move back to Oregon, we would like to help you start a singing career. And so I thought, this is it, God's plan for my life. So I asked my parents and they said, this is great. Let's do this, go for it. So that summer I packed up everything about two weeks ready to move back to Oregon. I was outside on the farm playing with the dogs and my dad walked out and he said, you're not going. And I said, what? And he said, you're not going. I said, can you tell me why? And he said, no, your mom and I just don't have a piece about it. And he turned and walked away. And I was so excited, ladies, because it was the first time. And what I've learned, the more we are in the word and we feed on the word and do the word, eventually we will have the mind of Christ. And for the first time, you know, like when my dad told me, you're lazy. Okay, my first response was not Christ-like. I had to check it and say, oh, no, nope, don't tell him what you think of him. Instead, what would Christ do? The, I had finally been doing it long enough that my first response was, oh, wow. God has something even better than that. I don't want to be anywhere God doesn't want me to be. And, you know, I, I hear people all the time say, if God would just make his will clear to me, he does. And he will if you're yielded. But most of us, self is on the throne. We, we have to screen it before we give God the okay. He's not, that's why I said, that's what was so valuable about honoring your parents. I think that's why God orchestrated it so that children were under parents. Because if you can learn to be obedient and honor them, then you're usable by God. Because if you won't do what your parents say, then what makes you think that God can say, go to Pongo Pongo and witness and you'll go, I'm on it. You won't because self will be in the way. I love the quote by the Puritan that said, self is the source of leanness of the soul. God, you have to deal with self. Um, is this making sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. We didn't get much into 15, did we? But we're, we're, we're going to talk about briefly. We just have a few minutes. Um, the thing that is so important about chapter 15 is four things are mentioned. The vine, the husbandman, fruit, oh, the branches. Okay. And this whole chapter is about fruit bearing. In fact, fruit is mentioned eight times. So I think it's important to God. He wants us to bear fruit. And the vine, notice it says, I am the true vine. Why do you think it says the true vine? Did you find anything? Why did it just say I'm the vine? Why am I the true vine? The context was Israel. Right. Israel was often referred to in the Old Testament as the vine. Did you find that? It's it's all in. Uh, let me say I wrote down. In, you didn't. You need to look this up. Psalm 80 verses 8 through 19. Isaiah 5 1 through 7. Jeremiah 2 21. Ezekiel 19 10 through 14. In Hosea chapter 10, God keeps referring to Israel as they were the vine, that he transplanted them out of Egypt into the Holy Land, and they were to demonstrate to the world what God is like. And they were an unfruitful vine. They were rebellious. They continued turned away from God. And so Jesus is not saying, I'm true in that they were a false vine, but I'm like, I'm the fulfillment. I'm the pinnacle vine. Because I'm the true vine that's going to show the world what God is like. Now, notice this is our seventh I am statement. Can somebody quickly tell us the others? 
Can you name all seven? What? The way, the truth, and the life. True vine. Okay, so if Jesus is the vine, pictured as the husbandman, that's what my version says. What did anybody else's translation say? The gardener or the vine dresser. He is the one that cares for the garden, cultivates it, okay, and establishes the, the garden, all right? And uh, there's some very difficult passages in here. Like I was shocked at how different commentaries do that about, um, you know, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And they talked about that that was judgment and God killing somebody and whatever. But I love Dr. Mitchell's. I thought his was the best. I think they get into that problem because in the Greek, more often than not, it's not translated take away. It's translated lift up. Did you find that? So if there is a branch, okay, because God, first of all, is a tender vine dresser. Okay. And so if a young believer is not bearing fruit, then God lifts them up to the air and the sun so that they can bring fruit. He's desirous of fruit. He's not desirous of destroying. He wants the, us to produce fruit. Now, do we produce fruit on our own? No, it all comes from the vine is the source and the origin. All right. Um, so I believe Dr. Mitchell's right that that's what that means when it says it lifts up. Now, notice in first it says it, the first thing is a, a, a branch is not bearing fruit. Then it bears fruit and then it bears more fruit and then it bears much fruit. And it says that God is glorified when we bear much fruit. Any idea what fruit is? What is the fruit Jesus is looking for? We, I talked about some of it. When we witness to people, they come up Christ. Okay, fruit can be people that we that we God uses us to lead people to Christ. He, you know, isn't it exciting that God? It says that we are His workmanship, and the word is poem. As an English teacher, I love that we're His poem, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Okay, now that is the contrast to dead works that the unsaved do, all right? The unsaved do dead works. And the Bible refers to works a lot in Romans. It's salvation is a gift of God, not of works. What does that mean? You can't, the, the, the law, all of the law, and remember there weren't just 10 commandments, there's 613 or 31, I can't remember, over 600 laws and precepts that we were to keep. And the point was, it is an achieving system. But the problem is you had to do them all to be okay. And we can't do that. I, I always, you know, those first promise keeper meetings, when, when, when the law was given and Moses said, yeah, let's do, we'll do, and the Israelites said, we'll do everything written in it. Did they ever do that? No, no. In fact, and then Paul said, I didn't know what sin was until I shall not covet. And when I read thou shalt not covet, all kind of covetousness came out for me. Okay, the law actually is a sin promoter, right? You tell a little kid, don't go into that closet where they want to go, okay? It shows that we have a sin nature, okay? Well, how is that different? Dead works contrasted to good works. Good works originate in and through Christ, I love what one commentator said. He said, being in Christ is salvation. Living life with Christ is abiding or fellowship. Oh, excuse me, is fellowship. Living with Christ, living by him is abiding and bearing fruit. Okay? So the, the whole idea of abiding is that it's not self-effort. It's drawing everything from Christ, letting him live his life through me and others. God will be glorified by the fruit and others will see Jesus. So it's not just souls that we win though. An important part of fruit that attracts people to Christ 
is our character. Okay, that adding to your faith virtue. Do I look like Jesus? Do I respond like Jesus? Just like Corey Tim Boom in that concentration camp. When she started sacrificially loving, when you're in a concentration camp and you give your blanket away, who do you look like? Jesus. And they're going to say, what is the reason for the hope that lies within you? You're different. Because I'm from a different country. And let me tell you about the one I serve. Okay, so you see, it's so tied with knowing the word and with obedience. Right. Yeah, I had a widow tell me a couple days ago that some Christians came to her and said, Well, yeah, if I lost my husband, I'd be a bastard. And we can't do that. No. We have to. We have to stand out. Exactly. We do. We do. And it's not an option. And so we learn in this passage, we'll go on to say that if we continue not to bear fruit, then we can die prematurely. And that's what Dr. Mitchell says. That verse says there, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, it's not that we as believers are burned, but it's the passage in Corinthians about our works, the, the fruit that we brought forth. If, if we're not bringing forth good fruit that glorifies God and we're not abiding, then we're going to bring fleshly fruit and that will burn. And so in Corinthians, it says that every believer is going to stand before Christ and their works will be judged, whether they were hay, stubble, or gold or priceless gems. And it's going to be the, tested by fire. And what is not a good work is not of God will be burned up. So we'll lose rewards. Does that, does that make sense? So if this is, it's an ominous warning. It's a good motivator to, to abide. Somebody told me one time, the two greatest motivators are in, in the world are a desire for gain and a fear of loss. And guess which one is the greater motivator? The fear of loss. Okay. I tried to diet and exercise so many times and people would show me pictures of what I could look like. That's the desire for gain. Oh, you could be healthy, whatever. I wasn't very motivated. But the fear of loss, you know what? If, you're gonna, if you don't do this, you're not going to be able to walk in a year. Okay, I think I'll, I'll start exercising, okay? The fear, and it's the same. More people are not won to God by the thought of heaven, which would be the desire for gain. More people come to Christ by the fear of hell, what they're going to lose. It, it's what scared me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so God is telling us, I'm going to give you a little motivator because this is what you're going to lose if you don't abide. Now, I do want to point out, ladies, because I'm almost out of time, is if you didn't get it, when Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches, and in verse four, he says, abide in me. Guess what, ladies? That's a command. If we want God to manifest himself to us and be real to us, we have to abide. Let me ask, do you feel like you know what abiding is? Does, did anybody's translation use a different word? Remain. Remain. Okay, continue. One was dwell in. Okay, you're not saying much. Does everybody feel like they could go out here and know how to abide? Anybody got some helps that they could, you could share that has helped you abide in Christ? You mean like memorizing? Scriptures? Yes. Memorizing scriptures. Memorizing scripture is a great one. Okay. I, I have a little study book. Uh, it's a, it has um, four quadrants. And the first one is scripture for the day. Lord, teach me to what I'm thankful for, what I'm praying for. So it helps me, these boxes help me after I'm reading, 
focused on what I, the scripture that caught me and then what I want to do with that and then the, go into prayer. So it really helps me focus in a rock. Right. Okay. That's great. One, one book I do want to recommend that um, I, I wrote down about four pages of quotes from this book I wanted to share with you, but I would encourage everybody to get this book. If you want to understand this command, it's by Andrew Murray. Anything you find by Andrew Murray will bless your socks off. This is called Abide in Christ, The Joy of Being in God's Presence. Another book that I think every woman, Christian woman should have in her library is um, Practicing the Presence of God. It's considered a Christian classic. It's from several hundred years ago by Brother Lawrence, and he was a monk. And he was, he got kitchen duty all the time and he hated kitchen duty. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to, God is going to be so real to me in this kitchen that I will even love doing dishes with Jesus because he's here with me. And what happened is he just started writing letters because other monks and other people would ask him, God is so real to you. There would be, there would be, um, men in the monastery that would say, could I have kitchen duty with Brother Lawrence? Because God is more real to him in that kitchen than when I'm in the chapel. And so he didn't even write the book. These are letters that he wrote to other people about his experience of how do you enjoy the presence of God? And I've heard of other believers, they said this about Borden of India, who was a missionary to India, that he would say, God is more real to me than any person in this room. Okay, that is in this book, Abide in Christ. How do we do that? How do we spend time with God so that we're communing with him all the time? And he, we realize that he, he is like a Siamese twin with me. I sing in the shower. That's what singing, <laughs> praising. One of the things that I would encourage you to do that has really blessed me immensely is um, when I find something that's not true of me and I want it to be true of me to memorize that passage of scripture and then put myself to sleep saying that scripture and then pleading with God let me have the mind of Christ let that be in me one of my favorites one one summer um, I felt like my love for the Lord was growing a little stale. And so I memorized Psalm 63. And for three months, every night, I put myself to sleep with that Psalm. It is still one of my favorites. So how, what that looks like is I would say, oh God, thou art my God. And then I would stop and I'd think about that. And I would say, do I realize what I am getting to say? David wrote this song. And David was marveling that the God of the universe is mine. And so I would that, praise God a little bit for that. Oh, God, thou art my God. You were David's God. You were Paul's God. And you've revealed yourself to me and you are my God. I want fellowship with you. And then it said, early will I seek thee. My flesh longs for thee. And I'd say, God, make my flesh, make that true of me. Make me so hungry for you. My flesh longs for you. My soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land. And I'd say, Lord, I have seen, this is a very dry and weary world, but I keep trying to drink from cisterns that won't satisfy as you say in Jeremiah, they're broken cisterns and they're, I will not be satisfied. So Lord, let me thirst for you in a dry, let me see your power and glory just as David saw you in the sanctuary. And then it says, my, my lips will praise thee with joyful lips because you have been my help. Your love is kindness is better than life. Let that be true for me, Lord. And then it says, my soul will be satisfied. Lord, I want to be satisfied. And I want to be satisfied with you. You're the only thing that can satisfy. And when does it say it'll happen? I will be satisfied when I meditate on you in the night watches. So Lord, tonight, I'm going to meditate on you in the night watches. What did I learn about you today? And it might have been perhaps that that day I was in Hebrews and it says that you created all things 
and by you, you uphold all things. And it says you are the exact uh, impression of God. You're the exact representation of who God is. So Lord, the more I know about you, the more I know God. And I'm going to dwell on that. And it says, by yourself, you purged my sin. Lord, I'm going to dwell on that. And I will be satisfied in, in you as I meditate on you in the night watches. That is a wonderful thing. I would encourage you, find a passage of scripture that, a, that you want to be true for you and then say it back to God and put yourself to sleep with it. It'll change your dreams. It'll change your thinking. Nikki. Kathy, another book you recommended, Valley of Dreams. Those prayers. Of the Puritans. They're just so rich with scripture that it's a, a prayer you just shared with us right now. That, that's the way to pray. And it's an amazing It is an amazing book. Give me one more minute. I, I put down here just some quotes by famous Christians that I admire. Is everybody familiar with John Piper? Oh my goodness. He loves God and he loves to spend time with him. And he said, abiding includes believing, trusting, savoring, resting, and receiving. First of all, I think the essential meaning, meaning of our active abiding is the act of receiving and trusting all that God is for us in Christ. It's the branch receiving all that the vine has to give. Okay, so it's just, it, and again, he says, without me, you can do nothing. And I love Oswald Chambers. He said that he believes most of our fruit that comes from abiding, we won't even be aware of it. It'll happen and we won't even be aware of it, okay? Um, another thing I love that Dr. Mitchell says is that our life comes through union with Christ, but fruitage comes from communion with Christ. So you have to be in love with him and delighting in him, spending time with him in the word and being obedient and the fruit will come. Um, let me just quote, I wanted to show you this. Where did I put it? Some quotes that I love. Is everybody familiar with Oswald Chambers? He wrote my utmost for his highest. Actually, it was his wife who did it after he passed away. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to read about obedience that he said, all, and you know, he does them by dates. And this one was on 516. All that the almighty God is, is ours in the Lord Jesus. And he will tax the last grain of sand and the remotest star to bless us if we will obey. Ladies, I saw that when, when I would come across a command of Christ that said to clear your conscience, if you're bringing your gift to the altar and there you remember that somebody has ought against you, go and be reconciled. You know, I told you when I said, Lord, I don't know where that lady is. I cheated off of her paper, but I have no idea where she is. He says, if you mean business, God will tax the last grain of sand and the remotest star to bless you. And her car broke down right down there on Crawford Road, on Ropes and Ranch Road. Okay. Or the girl I held in the ant bed. I had no idea where she was. And God has her sit right next to me in the movie theater, in the movie, The Way We Were. I just think God has <laughs> such a sense of humor. Okay. And this is something else he says. The golden rule for understanding spiritually. We wonder, we wonder why we don't get more of scripture. The golden rule for understanding spiritually is not intellect, but obedience. If you want insight into what Jesus Christ teaches, you can only get it by obedience. Spiritual darkness comes because of something I do not intend to obey. Isn't that convicting? Mm -hmm. All God's revelations are sealed until they are open to us by obedience. Immediately you obey, a flash of light comes. Obey God in the thing he shows you, and instantly the next thing is opened up. One reads tomes on the work of the Holy Spirit when five minutes of drastic obedience would make things as clear as a sunbeam. Isn't that beautiful? The tiniest detail in which I obey has all the omnipotent power 
of the grace of God behind it. Okay, ladies, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you that I could um, be here with these women and we could just share the wonderful truth, the command to abide. Lord, it's how the world will see Christ in us is only when we're abiding. And Lord, I remember Dr. Mitchell telling me that each person in this room has all of God that they want. Oh, Lord, make us want you more. Make us hungry for you. To abide in you, to please you, to delight your heart. And Lord, as we do that, as you do that work in us, we will anticipate the wonderful things you're going to show us and reveal to us. Because you are a God who loves to give and who loves to reward. Lord, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And there was one uh, quote, um, Billy prayer, prayer, more prayer. <laughs> exactly. And we saw in our chapter that prayer is a big part of abiding. And we will have answered prayer. Thank you, lady. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.